Butler, in like typical fashion, asked me to preach with short notice. So. <laughs> Late yesterday evening, he texted me. Uh, let's go to the book of Zechariah. Uh, it's not one we go to very often, actually. I can't recall ever hearing a sermon out of this book. Or if you have preached out of it, forgive me for not remembering. I don't believe I have. Zechariah, it's right before Malachi. Malachi being the last of the Old Testament prophets because John the Baptist comes on the scene. Zechariah is actually the longest of the what we call the minor prophets. I was trying to skim through here, and I'm actually not sure why we don't go to it more often. Right. It talks a lot about how Israel is ultimately triumphant and her foes are defeated. <coughs> mentions the return of Christ. Amen. And as we'll see in our text, it points to Christ. Christ himself even quotes from the book when he tells his disciples to go get a a donkey for him to ride on. That's from chapter 9. Mm -hmm. But we'll go to chapter 3 of Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah is also translated as Zechariah, and the Greek version being Zacharias. I'm sure we're familiar with Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. It's actually quite a common Jewish name. I was looking through the Zechariahs, and there's I don't know, somewhere around 30 or 40 different Zacharias. Yeah. And here we have Zechariah the prophet. He was a contemporary of Haggai, lived during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. If you recall from Adam's class, a few months back, we looked at Haggai, and his message was short, but it was pretty simple. He let the house of the Lord fall into disrepair. All these bad things are happening. Now y'all need to do something about it. Right. Zechariah preached a similar message, but he, he had quite a few visions. This vision goes all the way back to chapter 1. We'll pick up here in the first verse of chapter 3 and read through verse 8. Here it says, And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. The Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garment from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thy iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by, and the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at, for behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to gather with our people today, Lord. But as we look in thy word, I pray that you meet with us, you stir us up as your people, to bless as your words proclaimed. I pray that you might edify the saints, that the name of Christ might be lifted up, and thou might be glorified. I do pray that you might save lost souls even among us today, Lord. And bless yes, us, Lord. Bless as the messages go out over the internet, Lord. I pray that you use that ministry as well. Bless the Mission ever in Paris, Lord, I pray that you might establish a church through that and save souls through that work as well. Yes, Lord. We just thank you for all that you do for us, for Christ and his sacrifice, for the great faithfulness towards us. It's in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Here, Zechariah is showed, it says, Joshua the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Now, this, uh, Joshua the high priest is also called Joshua the son of Josedek. He is Joshua the son of jo Josedek and Haggai. He's a Joshua the son of Josedek and Ezra and Nehemiah. Same name, just different spellings. But he was the high priest after the return from captivity. Mm -hmm. 
you know, as, I, as I mentioned there, Haggai pointed out how the temple had fallen into disrepair and how God's people were really in spiritual disrepair. Yeah. They needed to get to work. Amen. Joshua <laughs> here was the high priest during this time, and it says he was standing before the angel of the Lord. This Joshua is said in Ezra chapter 3 to help build a new offer for burnt offerings. It said in chapter 5 of Ezra that he helped to rebuild the house of God. It was one of the first ones. It's also interesting to note in Ezra chapter 10, it says of his sons that they married strange wives. But then they did put them away and offer a trespass offering. But here he's standing before the angel of the Lord. And most commentators think this is referring to Christ himself as mediator and advocate. And I can see that Christ and Satan there to accuse Christ as their advocate. Right. Satan is ever ready to accuse. You're right. Yeah. In fact, that's really his chief, I guess, goal, if you will, to accuse the people of God. Mm -hmm. um, I had a conversation, I think it was Adam, maybe with Larry as well. Satan is not mentioned by name a whole lot outside of the book of Job, just being one of the few places. Right. In the Old Testament, that is. Here he, we find him standing to resist Joshua, the high priest. You know, Satan literally means an adversary. The first Peter 5, 8 calls him our adversary, the devil. Mm -hmm. You walk about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's it. But here he is standing before to resist or to accuse Joshua the high priest. Well, he is the great accuser in Revelation 12. Mm -hmm. In fact, in Revelation 12, 10, it tells us that the great accuser was cast down. But I'm sure today he stands ready to accuse those that are really trying to do God's work. Really, I think he stands to accuse anybody. Mm -hmm. I don't know that he knows who the elect are any more than we do. Mm -hmm. Amen. Right. Satan's job is to accuse before God. You know, he wants to lay something to our charge. What did Romans 8 say? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Is God that justified? Yeah, amen. Back in verse 2 here, the Lord rebukes him. It says, And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? God rebukes those that oppose his children. Amen. Whether it be Satan or the wicked of this world, yeah. we can be sure that they might accuse us for a time, but we as his people will get the ultimate victory. Won't we? Yeah. Israel oftentimes went through some what we would call hard times, but yet Zechariah prom prophesies over and over again how they will get the ultimate victory. Amen. We can be sure. You know, as a, one person said, I read the back of the book and I see who wins. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I can't guarantee tribulations won't come our way. Our times will come our way. Persecutions might come our way. But ultimately, we as God's people win. That's it. That's right. Amen. So it doesn't matter who comes against us. In fact, I mentioned Romans 8, verse 31 says, If God be for us, who can be against us? That's it. Yeah. Amen. The world may rise up against us, but yet with God's force, we'll be the ultimate victors. Yeah. He says, is not just a brand plucked out of the fire. It's brand, it also could be a fire brand, as it's translated. And this was a stick used as a poker to stir the fire. Left to itself, it would be consumed. You don't pluck it out, though. Right. Are we not the same way? Left to ourselves, we would be Consumed when we yeah. by our sin, ultimately in the lake of fire. <coughs> John three eighteen says that for those that don't believe, they're condemned already. Mm -hmm. Amen. Man left to himself is condemned in his lost state. 
But yet God has plucked us out of the fire, if you will. Mm -hmm. Both literally and figuratively, if I can say it that way. You know, before time existed, I know God chose those who are His. But in the process of time, we were in sin. In the process of time, God had come and make that work effectual in our hearts. And in a sense, plucked us from the fire. This is the fire brand is plucked from the fire. Mm -hmm. Verse 3 here says, Now Joshua was, was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Joshua was not quite innocent here, was he? Mm -hmm. It says he was clothed with filthy garments. And when you come with anything other than Christ, you're coming before God with filthy garments. I think we all know Isaiah 64, 6 that says that all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Yeah, yeah. When we bring our own righteousness, when we bring our own quote unquote good works, Amen. we're coming dressed with a filthy garment. That's right. it. So I don't know if Joshua was, had sin in his life or if he was unregenerate, but yet he was here before God or the angel of the Lord, as it's called here, with a filthy garment on him. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Oh, let us not come before God with a filthy garment. Amen. Oh, we ought to come to Him clinging to Christ and Christ alone. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I said, you, your good works, your baptism, your church membership, all that means nothing if you don't have Christ to save you. Amen. It's all but a filthy garment. No, we... We're all just a Joshua coming before God in and of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Amen. It says, He stood before the angel with a filthy garment. Notice the. Actually, let's turn over to Psalms 14 for a moment. Hmm. I forget exactly what that says. Psalms 14, well, verse 3. We looked at this recently in. Adam's class, we go ahead and read verse 2 as well. It says, The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. Those first three, they're all gone aside. They're all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Right. Man in and of himself is filthy. Mm -hmm. Not good. There's no under, right understanding of God, if you will. Because sin is filthy. Amen. Brother uh, Junior mentioned those that are polluted with this world, the world will make you filthy. That's it. Amen. The sow, she is filthy naturally, isn't she? Yep. You can come in and wash her up, but she'll run right back to the mud. Yeah. You know, my grandpa used to raise hogs sometimes. I never seen him wash one up. <laughs> but they were always. Dirty animals on the outside, at least. Yep. Maybe that's why God said not to eat them in the Old Testament. I don't know. But they, they're they definitely not the cleanest of animals. Huh. <coughs> Man is not clean either, though, in and of itself. That's it. But yet, man wants to bring his filthiness before God and say, Look what I have for you, God. Mm -hmm. That in and of itself will never be good enough, will it? God is not pleased with filthy garments. It's it. Yeah. So let's notice verse 4 back in our text here. It says, And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, We this is the Lord speaking here and now to Joshua, Behold, I have caused thy iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. It takes God to change a raiment, doesn't it? Amen. Mm -hmm. Joshua didn't say, oh, God, I've got this filthy raiment, and I need you to give me a new one. Well, God himself said, take away the filthy garments. And I will give the change of raiment. Take away his sin, and I will give him righteousness. as the spiritual application there. Amen. That God must take away our sin, and he must impart unto us his righteousness. Without getting too... Theological. So our sins are imputed unto Christ and his righteousness is imputed unto us. Amen. Let's go back to Psalms again. Psalms <coughs> this time. I 
think these are probably familiar verses to us, but Psalms 103. We can read the whole psalm. We'll look at a couple verses. Of Verse 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. God forgives all our iniquities, not just some of them. He didn't return back to Joshua a halfway clean garment. Right. Amen. Go on down to verse 10. It says, He hath not dealt with us after our sins. Thank the Lord for that. Mm-hmm. Nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Amen. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. So God... He had dealt with us after our sins and rewarded us after our iniquities. We would all already be in hell today, wouldn't we? You're right. But yet, His great love, wherein He had loved us, He was no mercy and grace upon yeah. us. And it says He's removed as far as the east is from the west our transgressions from us. I point this out before. You can go east as long as you want to, and you'll never end up going west, mm-hmm. and vice versa, the same as well. It's it. Amen. You know, they're infinitely removed from us. God will never bring them up again to our account. Amen. Yeah. Yet there's so many today that are trusting in what they can do, what they have done, what they hope will happen when they stand before God. Yet God is able to do a certain work in our hearts. And, you know, he's able to take away that sin and give us this Robe of righteousness as it's called over in Isaiah. Amen. Let's turn there for a moment. Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah 61, verse number 10. It says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garment of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. Amen. As a bridegroom decked himself with ornaments, as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. So if God has not clothed you with the garment of salvation, then you don't have salvation. You got it. If he has not given you that robe of righteousness, as he calls it here, then you don't have righteousness. That was the problem with the Pharisees. They had on their filthy garments trying to pretend on they had a robe of righteousness. And yet so many professing Christians today do the same thing, don't they? Mm-hmm. They act as if their own righteousness, their own good works, their own stuff that they have done is going to be presentable to God. That's pleasing to the flesh, isn't it? That's what the flesh wants. It's it. Amen. Yet, in a sense, salvation, true salvation is so easy, isn't it? Just that Christ has done it all for us. Amen. I'm not saying it's something the flesh can do, but yet it's really something the flesh can't do. But yet Christ has done it for us. Christ has done it all for us. I believe we ought to serve him because we are saved, because he has saved us, as Brother Junior pointed out. We have good works because he has worked the work of grace in our hearts. Amen. None of those things keep us saved. None of those things made us saved. It's it. We ought not to hang our hat, so to speak, on those things. You know, I could point to each and every one of us here probably have something in the flesh we could brag about. Well, Larry, you've been in the ministry for well over 20 years now. Uh, I don't know, Brother Junior, you've probably been teaching longer than me and Brother Kenny have been alive combined. <laughs> Brother Kenny, you probably preached in more churches than just about anybody else is 20 years old. Nope. Brother Adam doesn't like to get accolades, but yet through his work on the computer, we sent the gospel to literally throughout the entire world. Amen. And all those things are good and well, and we ought to thank God that he has used us such a way. Yet, yeah. if we're trusting in those things, we're trusting in the wrong thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Many will say to him that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. But his response isn't to him. Well, don't have been a faithful servant, was it? Uh-uh. It was depart from me, workers of iniquity, for I never knew ye. It's it. That's right. 
And there's many, many, many today that are <coughs> trusting what they think they have done for God. Yeah. Yeah. We ought to just simply trust in Christ. Amen. He says here, back in our text, I have caused thy iniquity to pass from thee, and I'll give thee change of raiment. Well, God will give us this change of raiment if you haven't, if you're still wearing that filthy garment of sin. Mm -hmm. Verse 5 goes on to saying, I said, I think this is Zechariah speaking now, let him set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. Amen. This fair mitre is a pure or clean mitre, a headdress, if you will. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's interesting to know that it's also translated diadem, which is a type of crown. But the mitre was part of the priestly garment. We might turn there, but I think it's over in Exodus 28 describes. The, mitre, the priestly garment and the mitre is mentioned there. Leviticus 16 also describes it. Let's go ahead and actually I do want to read one point in Exodus 28. Because the mitre was a symbol of holiness for the priest. Exodus 28. Notice verses 3 and 4 it says, Thou shalt speak unto all that are wise hearted in my filled spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And, they, and these are the garments which they shall make a breastplate, and an ephod, and a robe, and a bordered coat, and a miter, and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron, mm -hmm. thy brother, and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. If you go on down to verse 36, he is describing these garments in more detail. And it says, And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold, engrave upon it like the engraving of a signet, holiness to the Lord. Amen. And thou shalt put on, put on a blue lace, and thou shalt or that it may be upon the mitre, upon the forefront of the mitre it shall be. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things, which the children of Israel shall hollow in all their holy gifts, and it shall always be upon his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. Amen. So upon this head covering, if you will, is a, really like a turban, if I understand correctly, it's wrapped around their head. And this plate right in the front of it, mm -hmm. holiness to the Lord. Amen. It's not Christ our holiness. Certainly we have a responsibility to be to live holy. But then our position before God, Christ, is our righteousness, our sanctification, our He's our everything, isn't He? Amen. And He is our head according to 1 Corinthians 11. The head of every man is Christ. Mm -hmm. Here, Joshua had put on this fair mitre, it's called this pure and clean head covering of type. Mm -hmm. That certainly points to Christ, doesn't it? That He Amen. is our pure and clean head covering, if you will. He is our really our pure and clean holiness before God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Ephesians 4.24 tells us that we are put on the new man which is created in righteousness and holiness. It's only in Christ that we can have that righteousness and holiness. A man can seek after those things in the flesh, but they will always be filthy and dirty garments. Amen. Verse 6 back in our text says in verse 7, And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, if thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these and stand by. The Lord will bless if we follow his ways, one. Amen. Man's ways are not right before God. Like Proverbs 14 and Proverbs 16 say there's a 
Lay what sin is right unto the man, but then there are other ways of death. That's it. That's the way many are walking today, even professing Christians. In a way that seems right to themselves. Mm -hmm. Amen. What well, is that? Wrote in that newspaper article a few weeks back. We need to go back to the old paths, the ways Amen. which are of God. A man has made a mess of trying to go his own way. I think mean, we see it in our country today. We've got umpteen different genders and mm. men marrying men. And <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We got supposed. We got a man pretending to be a woman. Trying to compete against women in sports now. That's the newest thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know I don't know if it passed, but Tennessee was trying to pass a bill to make that illegal, at least in college sports. Mm -hmm. I'll have my, you know, sports are a different topic for another time. We get men and women are yes, we are equal before God. We are but we are not the same in our roles in society, are we? Man has his role to be a provider, to be a caretaker. A woman has her role to take care of the house and to raise up the children. And certainly that's not the only things. But yet, society has concluded those two things. Amen. You're right. Really, women have the most important job in society. That is to raise up the next generation. To, Amen. You're right. To teach them the ways of God. Right. Yeah, men, we are not without fault either. Yeah, society has really messed up things trying to go their own way. So we can't expect blessings from God when we follow society. That's it. Yep. Here he tells Joshua, he'll just follow the Lord's ways, he will bless. He said, I will. He says, Then thou shalt judge my house, and thou shalt keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these and stand by. We just simply need to trust God and let Him work out the rest, don't we? Amen. What does Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 say? Chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not unto thy understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. Amen. Yeah. The way of the Lord isn't always one that's planned out far ahead of time. Sometimes it's just taking one step at a time, isn't it? Amen. Yet we are simply trust the Lord and follow His leading. You know, I understand the Holy Spirit leads each one of us individually. We get His Word gives us guidance on how to live our lives, is not it? Amen. His Word tells us the ways of God and how we are to conduct ourselves. Like Psalms 119 tells us that his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Amen. Well, if we are guided by anything besides God's word, we're guided by the wrong thing. Absolutely. You know, all the Joe Osteen books you want won't help if you're not following the word of God. Amen. Brother King's going to use his material when he teaches ex expository <laughs> preaching, he said. Amen. <laughs> well, all the self help books in the world won't help you if you're not following. The Word of God. You're right. Well, I certainly enjoy the writings of men, godly men. Yet we not, they can't take the place of God's Word. Amen. Amen. Well, I often say we must remember that men are at best, <coughs> excuse me, men at best are men at best. Mm -hmm. That's it. That they're no more than we are, fallible and Sinful creatures. If we had God's word, it is sure. It is never changing. It is. We can trust in it no matter what may come our way, no matter what the world may be saying, no matter what the world may be doing, that we can follow the ways of God and we can be sure it will work out for him. Amen. It might not make us popular in the world, it might not win us many friends of this world. In fact, it might make us many enemies. Like I said earlier, we are the ultimate victors anyway. Amen. Let's go on to verse number 8 here. It says, Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. 
This was the high priest and the other priest here, and they were men of high esteem, if you will, among the Jews. Well, they had certainly an important role to administer the law, and especially the sacrifices. Mm -hmm. But they were nothing at what was coming, weren't they? Amen. They were types of Christ, but they could not compare to Christ. That's it. He is the great high priest. Well, we saw that when we looked in the book of Hebrews. That he is the ultimate fulfillment of the great high priesthood. At the end of our verse there, sir, it's for behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Mm -hmm. Amen. And that branch is Christ. Amen. We're going to look at a few places regarding that. We notice he, Christ himself was even called a servant. Mm -hmm. Christ did not seek the praises of men or places of high esteem. No. We can turn over that prophecy I mentioned in Zechariah 9. I didn't write it down, but I'll find it for us here. judgment and justice in the earth. Amen. That branch, which is Christ, which was the Messiah, he would, it says he would raise, be raised up unto David. Certainly Amen. he was the, the son of David in the fleshly sense. It says he, the king, he shall reign and prosper, shall execute judgment, judgment and justice in the earth. Well, he was the king of the Jews, whether they accepted him or not. Amen. So that one day he will he will rule with a rod of iron, and there will be just judgment and justice on the earth. Go over to chapter 33, speaks again of this branch referring to Christ. Amen. 33, verse 15 says, In those days, and at that time, I will cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. Here he's called the branch of righteousness. Mm -hmm. And certainly Christ yeah. is righteousness, perfect righteousness. It says he shall cause him to grow up unto David and shall he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. Amen. Righteousness didn't come before Christ, did it? You're right. Or outside of Christ, if you will. Well, in fact, I think it's over in Galatians that says. For if righteousness could come by the law, then Christ died in vain. Mm. Well, Christ is that righteousness that we all need, that we all stand, Amen. stand, stand in need of in and of ourselves. With it. You know, if you're lost, you still stand in need of it. If you're saved, you only can claim it by the work of Christ. Amen. Let's go again to Isaiah. We're probably familiar with at least one of these passages, Isaiah chapter 11 to begin with. Find my place here. Isaiah chapter 11, first four verses. It says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. Amen. Shall make him of quick understanding the fear of the Lord, shall, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither shall reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Amen. Here again we see this branch referring to Christ. 
Amen. Now the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. It says that he, he didn't judge after the sight of his eyes, he didn't reprove after the hearing of his ears. Christ knew the hearts, didn't he? Well, he said in one place that these people draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That's it. We can fool men with lip service to the Lord, but we can't fool God himself. We can put on a show before men and make it look like we're really doing something, but God knows That's right. the hearts. He knows our intents. He knows Amen. what we do in secret and why we do what we do. There is really no secret thing before the Lord, is there? Mm -hmm. it was that last part of verse 4 says, And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. That points to his second coming, doesn't it? Amen. Just so they will speak and the wicked shall be destroyed. That is the Christ that we serve. Amen. Not some long hair hippie sitting around hoping you'll open your heart for him. That's it. Amen. Oh, this Christ we serve is the one who can, can and will one day destroy the wicked by just the word of his own mouth. Amen. And I think we're all familiar with Isaiah 53, but let's turn there. We can read the whole chapter, but the first five verses say, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not, surely had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we had esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgression, and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With the stripes we are healed. Amen. Yeah. Here he is called a, a tender plant and a root out of dry ground. And he did grow up, and he was yet rejected by his own, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. His own came to his own, his own received him not, the New Testament says. He is a spy that rejected him in a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. Yet we didn't go running to him, though, did we? It says we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was a spy, and we esteemed him not. Well, that Armenian teaching really goes out the window there, doesn't it? Amen. Amen. The man in of himself doesn't run to God. But thanks be to God, he came running to us. That's it. He was wounded for our transgressions, verse 5 says, and bruised for our iniquities. Verse 4 says that he bore our grace and carried our sorrows. That is this branch that was coming that Zechariah prophesied about. One who would save Israel, really, and all of God's people spiritually, and one day will save Israel in a physical sense as well. Amen. I do believe Israel will return back to God and see Christ for who he really is. I remember right, Zechariah does mention that somewhere in his prophecy. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to Zechariah one more time and we'll close. Zechariah, we're we'll looking verse for chapter 6. Here it refers to the branch once again. Zechariah 6, verse 12. It says, And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. Amen. And he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. And you might be saying, Well, Christ didn't build a physical temple, did he? That's what the Jews were thinking, too. Right. Over there in John chapter 2. Yeah. And he said, Destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. Their response was, 46 years this thing's been built and building, and you're going to raise it up in three days? Mm -hmm. well, he was speaking of his own body. Mm -hmm. In three days he would rise again, a victor over death, a victor over sin, a victor over the grave and hell as well. 
the branch shall grow up out of this place, and you shall build the temple of the Lord. Amen. And one day there will be coming when there won't be need of a temple anymore, will there? Amen. Not this physical temple. Really, there's no need of it now. It's, we have Christ. He is our high priest. He is our sacrifice. Amen. He is our everything that the law required. That's it. And one day we will be with him. Really, he will be our temple. That's right. I was trying to, I was hoping to find that verse, but I don't see it. I was thinking of. I'll have to find and share it with y'all later. But we'll close up our text here back in Zechariah chapter 3. But behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. Christ is the branch, as we mentioned. Christ Amen. is the one who was coming, the one who the Jews should have, should have been looking for. Yet he came, they completely missed him, missed him didn't they? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, physically, man could be looking right at Christ and wouldn't know who he is. That's it. Yeah, thanks be to God, he has revealed himself unto you. The branch is really the solution to our problem. Amen. The sin problem that we have, the society's problems that are all around us. This branch, which is Christ, he is the answer to everything. Amen. The high priests, they were important. Like I said, they had their, they had a great role to fulfill. As I pointed out, when we looked at this, our class back last year, those who didn't fulfill it correctly, they suffered for it. Mm -hmm. But they were nothing in comparison to Christ. Right. Well, let us be looking to Christ, who can give us this change of raiment. <laughs> let's not be, let's not come before God with filthy garments. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, He's the only one that can give that robe of righteousness. Amen. It can't be anything you do. Right. That's it. In fact, the more you try to filter, you'll get. The more you try to make it clean, the dirtier you'll make it. Yeah. But Christ gives this change of raiment. Look to Him and Him alone. Amen. We'll close with that thought of the Lord.